Welcome to People's Church. We welcome old friends and new. We welcome the young and the old. We welcome you if this is your first visit or if you've been here for years. We are happy that you are here with us today as you are an essential part of our community. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, many sexualities, and many genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Whether you are in person or joining us on Zoom, you are welcomed here just as you are. My name is Sharon Sauter and I'm a member of the Sunday Service Committee. Our guest speaker today is Heather Renter, wife, mom, daughter, sister. Our guest musician is her husband, Dave Renter, who is a professional musician and occupational therapist. Together, they have two children, four dogs, 10 cats, and a menagerie of farm animals. They live in Shelbyville and enjoy being outdoors in the garden and in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's time to light our chalice. If you're lighting a chalice at home, I invite you to type in the chat box, a chalice is lit wherever you are. Chalice lighting on thresholds. We kindle this flame, honoring the doorways in our souls, the windows through which we gaze at one another, the balconies where we catch glimpses of sky, the thresholds we stand on this morning, wondering, hoping, fearing, dreaming. People's Church is a community that supports one another. One of the ways we do this when we gather together is we invite people to share joys, sorrows, and milestones of their lives. If you have something to share and are on Zoom, please type it in the chat box. If you're in person, please come forward, speak briefly, share your name, and place a stone in the water. If you do not want to share, you can simply state your name and place a stone in the water. We will now pause the recordings while you share for confidentiality. The River of Community. A religious community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. As members and friends of this religious community, we share our time and energy, our creativity, imagination, vision, our talents, skills, and gifts, and the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and broad, a river that is made up of many streams, sustains life, and refreshes the land from, through which it flows. 
but the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real our shared values and vision. We will now receive our offering to support the important work that we do. Please join in reading, giving thanks for all that sustains us. From the countless gifts which each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. Our first reading is called For the Time of Necessary Decision. The mind of time is hard to read. We can never predict what it will bring, nor even from all that is already gone can we say what form it finally takes. For time gathers its moments secretly. Often we only know it's time to change when a force is built inside the heart that leaves us uneasy as we are. Perhaps the work we do has lost its soul or the love where we once belonged calls nothing alive in us anymore. We drift through this gray increasing nowhere until we stand before a threshold we know we have to cross to come alive once more. May we have the courage to take the step into the unknown that beckons us, trust that a richer life awaits us there, that we will lose nothing but what has already died. Feel the deeper knowing in us sure of all that is about to be born beyond the pale frames where we stayed confined, not realizing how such vacant endurance was bleaching our soul's desire. Good morning. We Look with Uncertainty by Ann Hillman. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness, which is every moment at the brink of death. For something new is being born in us, if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes, daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love.
Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Heather Renter, and I've been um, participating at People's Church for about a year, and it was very um, nice to be invited to share my reflection today. So when I was asked um, if I'd like to do a reflection on uncertainty, <laughs> I thought, hmm, I think I know a thing, of, thing or two about that. Um, so I'm going to share with you, um, kind of take you back in time in my life to tell you kind of at the end where I've come from in the last rather short period of time. Um, but before we do that, I did want to just caution, think of a, a gentle caution that I am going to try to um, speak a little bit about my recent um, experience with my dad's passing and his death. So if that's a sensitive topic for anyone, just know that I, I hope to talk about that. So I wanted to go back to the poem that Sharon read. <clears throat> um, it is, I can recall the name. For the time of a necessary decision, um, which is by John O'Donohue, he's a Irish poet. And in that poem, he said, often we only know it's time to change when a force has built inside the heart that leaves us uneasy as we are. So in thinking about my own experience in navigating uncertainty, I thought when I read this poem, as I have many times over the years, yes, <laughs> I know that force. I have felt that swelling of my heart and I have been uneasy as I am. So in the past two years, if we rewind to pretty much precisely two years ago, I was grading papers and I was bored into the semester. My computer was up and a little email popped into my window and there was a picture of this house. It was a house that had just been listed. I glanced up from my papers and I looked at the picture and I said, that is my house. <laughs> So to make a long story short, in 30 days, that house became my husband and I's house. And my husband trusted me enough to know that if I said it's my house, it was going to be my house, <laughs> our house. So we bought our home without any planning, without any financial advising, without having had a budget, without having been pre-approved. And most amazingly, I think, is that we bought the house without my husband ever physically seeing it <laughs> until we purchased it. <laughs> and it has become our home in so many ways. But many of my friends have said, how could you do that? Um, and my dad, in particular, was terrified um, with this decision to move forward with purchasing a house with so many unknowns and with so much uncertainty. And as if you recall two years ago with the housing market at that time, people were paying cash for homes, people were driving up the prices very much, and everything went very smoothly for us, but we also did not do a home inspection, <laughs> which my dad um, just could not fathom. My dad lived his life in paralysis quite, and that I don't mean that, I'm not over exaggerating, everything he did was um, meticulously thought out, planned, researched, and avoidant of risk to as much extent as possible. So that kind of kicked off my um, inertia <laughs> with uncertainty. And in the past six months, I have held the hand of my father as he died. I have had my sister and her new husband move into my house and live with us with their two dogs. So now we have six, about 600 pounds of dog running around yeah. between our four and their two. Um, <laughs> and I have helped my mother sell her home of 50 years and move to a new state. I have left a tenured faculty position and started a new job and a completely new career, all in the breadth of six months. So. I can say <laughs> with certainty that uncertainty has somehow, I have somehow befriended that. So I, it really was a reflective exercise in thinking about how is it that I have been able to do that? Because honestly, when I think about that and I think 
about the things that I have done myself, if I were, if my best friend or a family member or a loved one asked me for advice in the same situations that I have been in, I would have advised strongly <laughs> that this is not a good idea. <laughs> you should think about these things and you should do this and do that. When that never really occurred to me, I was full headlong into it. So what have I learned and why perhaps have these things happened the way that they have happened and why have I have behaved the way I have behaved? So I wanted to go back to 2006. So in 2006, I was in my 20s. I was um, married and I was very much longing to go back to graduate school. And this created a lot of stress between my then husband and myself. It was the first time in my life where I really loved something enough to want to do it regardless of the consequences. And I was also naive enough <laughs> to not know any better. So I didn't have all of the anxiety in my head of that uncertainty of what if, what if, what if this doesn't go the way that I want it to. So I applied and was admitted to a graduate program for the purpose for me was that I wanted to be able to be with older adults at the end of their lives in a way that I could change or influence that experience so that it was one that was meaningful and positive. I didn't think that older adults should die in suffering, which I had seen in hospitals and in nursing homes I had worked in. So that was my mantra, go to school, get this degree, do this work. So when I did that, my husband left and that became a, a problem <laughs> and I got divorced and I lost everything. So I lost my home, I lost my family, my friends, my, well, I say my family, my family stuck with me, um, but I left and I went to a different university or a different state that I had never lived in before. Everything was different. And when I lost my financial stability, I literally had the uncertainty of not knowing which bill I would or would not be able to pay. What was going to happen next? What was it, where was I going to eat? Where was I going to sleep? <laughs> so those were very, very real concerns to my immediate security and safety that I had to find ways to overcome. Through this time, I had a constant companion, and that constant companion was a little yellow lab named Harley. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit to 2016 when Harley died. Harley, when I lost Harley, she had been my co-pilot. She had been my constant companion that had gotten me through all of those terrible times, quite literally. The days where I didn't wanna get out of bed, she'd pull the covers off and drop a tennis ball in my face. <laughs> we were going to throw this ball if nothing else today, okay? So when I lost Harley, it literally was a question of uncertainty of how do I go on? How do I get through life without this being that helped me, that became my everything? <laughs> I, can't, I can't put that into words, what she was. And for the longest time, it was actually a couple of years. I had a two-year-old at the time when Harley died. And my two-year-old would come in the house every night and say, Mommy, where's Harley? Because she couldn't understand what it meant that Harley was really gone. And we had a little half bath off the side of the living room. And I would run into that bathroom and close the door and I would cry <laughs> every day for months and months. That uncertainty of what now? Where is she? What happened to her? Why did this happen? Okay. If we go back again <laughs> to 2006 when I had gotten divorced and I was in graduate school, uncertainty. How do I go on? The other uncertainty was that of what brought what that divorce brought into my life. There was a lot of bad stuff that came with that divorce that I could have never foreseen, could have never imagined, and sometimes still honestly think like, did that really happen? Was it, was it a dream? How could we have treated each other that way? So my response to that uncertainty was to run. And I ran as far away as I could get from central Indiana and Kentucky, where I was at the time, to Alaska. <laughs> I didn't have a job. I had no place to live. 
I bought a one-way open-ended ticket to Alaska and I left Harley with my parents and I went away. And I learned through that experience of being in Alaska and eventually working as a wilderness guide, which I honestly had no business doing, <laughs> the uncertainty. I don't know where that trail goes, but I'm gonna take these people up this trail. Okay. <laughs> um, but I learned very quickly in a very real ways, which is a whole other story, um, that you always go prepared. You always have a light. You always tell someone where you're going and how long you will be there. You have a crew of people who are ready to respond when you need it. And that proved to be one of the ways that I've navigated uncertainty in my life since that time. So when Harley died, I leaned into that. I don't know what's around the next corner. I don't know where this path will take me. I don't know how to get back home. But I had people, thank God, <laughs> right? And I had not intentionally planned to have those people, but I did. And that's one lesson in um, navigating uncertainty that has helped me get to where I am today, that I need to put investment into those people that are here with me now and to recognize and acknowledge the people that have gone before me and the people that will come behind me. Okay. Let me get back to my notes before we're here for two hours with me talking. <laughs> All right. So in those early 2000 periods, I got divorced. I moved to another state. I became a wilderness guide in Alaska. <laughs> I started a new job. I eventually graduated with my doctorate and I left Kentucky for a whole new country and I married a Canadian. <laughs> it was in very new territory now, right? So with that came uncertainty and change as well. So in 2016, when Harley died, was another threshold that I crossed in uncertainty and not knowing how do I live my life without this creature? Another threshold that happened around that time in my life was I got tenure. So tenure in academia is this, it's like hazing for adults. <laughs> you have to prove as if you hadn't already that you deserve to be in academia. So it was a time of great reflection. They require you to tell, you, tell them, tell your committee and your colleagues why you deserve to be in the, acad acad in a, the academy and why you should have tenure. And, be there forever. So that brought with it this opportunity to think about why I had gone to school and what I had sacrificed to make that happen, which I had never really done before. But because I had gone to school, I had lost a marriage, which needed to be lost. But I had lost a marriage, and I had lost a whole lot of other things. But I also gained a lot in the process too. So I hadn't really recognized that and reconciled that. But it was a threshold nonetheless, and I realized that as, although my work at university was fulfilling and it was satisfying and that it nourished me and that I had grown, I had forgotten about this seed of why I had gone to school and why I had sacrificed so much in the first place. And that was to help older adults to change the way people die in American healthcare systems. So that brings me to 2023, six months ago <clears throat> in February, sitting in a hospital, holding my dad's hand, knowing that the end was coming. It wasn't so much his death, but his dying and that journey. And the incredibly ironic thing of it all was that I was sitting in the same hospital I had worked in when I had made the decision to go back to school. I was in the same unit 20 some years later, holding my dad's hand, not a patient's hand, and nothing much had changed. The nurses still came in at 3 a.m. to do his vital signs. The doctors requested and stated that he needed to be restrained because his hallucinations were making it problematic for the staff. He was confused at the lights and the sounds in my family, although my expertise is to work with older adults, 
was left like everyone else trying to figure out what do we do now what's the right decision what does dad want and how do we get there while we're in the walls of the hospital so while i sat with that despair of losing my dad and watching him and wondering the same old questions again how will i live without this man how will i go on how will my children go on how will my mom go on what will life look like the answer was clear to me do the work my dad was in and out of delirium and in the wee hours of the morning i was holding his hand so he wouldn't be restrained and he looked over at me clear-eyed and strong-voiced and he said heather do the work you set out to do it was a threshold for both of us and we walked over it together death is the ultimate uncertainty <laughs> it's also the need certainty right all of us will go through that threshold but the certainty of all of these experiences that i've had and the lesson that i wanted to share is my reflection today and answering that question how do you navigate uncertainty in my experience it's moving you have to move doesn't have to be the right way because as my dad told me you never know which way the right way is it will be what it what it is right but you have to move and you have to feel that force that's building in your heart and when my dad was dying i recognized that because i had been i recognized that force the feeling of that force because i had been there so many times before my dad had always been there to catch me and i fell but it's that same thing i learned in alaska there's people that go before you there's people my children that will come behind me and there's the people that we have around us today my husband my friends people that i really barely know people from my talus circle that know some of my stories but who aren't intimately involved in my life in any way they are there in spirit when you're looking at that threshold and you have to step to the right to the left to the back but eventually you have to go through it so again to the poem often we only know it's time to change when a force is built inside the heart that leaves us uneasy as we are continuing we drift through this gray increasing nowhere <laughs> until we stand before a threshold we know we have to cross to come alive once more i am not the same person i was in 2006 or 16 or even six months ago i am better i am stronger i think i'm happier <laughs> So when I was sitting with my dad, and this is the last piece of the story in February in that hospital, and I had that recognition, that wind at my back, the hairs on my neck standing up, the I don't know, the ultimate I don't know, was this terrifying moment of I'm gonna lose my dad, but I'm doing the wrong work. <laughs> I'm doing good work that I love, that nurtures me, that I find satisfying. I have tenure. How did that happen? So in February, I had this great grief. My dad died in March. And on my way home from Indiana, after his death, my phone rang while I was driving. It was someone from five or six years ago <clears throat> who called to say, I have this job opportunity, and I think you're the right person for it. So in March, right after my dad's death, I turned in my resignation at Grand Valley, my tenured position that I thought was the pinnacle of my career, this achievement. And I took a job at Heritage Community of Kalamazoo, where every day I work with people and their families with dementia and memory loss. 
the big questions. What do I do when mom doesn't recognize me? What do I do when I promised my parents I wouldn't put them in a home? Right? What do I do when I find out that my mom spent $150,000 on QVC and they can't pay for it? You move, you lean in to your people. You think about the ones who've come before because there's always someone who's been there. You think about the people coming behind and you move forward. So I want to thank you all for listening to my story today. It's been therapeutic <laughs> for me to think about this and, um, and to reflect and to have a space to share it. So thank you for that. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> no, I'm good. This is a good switch for me. Okay. So we were asked to prepare discussion questions, which you'd think, having been a professor, I wouldn't forget that part. <laughs> okay. So we had some discussion questions that I'd like to offer, and we were going to, I don't know if we have anyone on Zoom, but one of the things we do at People's Church is talk to one another. So if we could maybe um, ask you to get in small groups, it doesn't have to be any particular number of people, but just to have some conversations and some thinking um, that you'd like to share. And we'll do that for about 10 minutes and then come back as a group. No one has to share anything that they don't want to share. Um, so there were four questions that I posed and I did just want to comment on one of them. Question number three, if the one thing you feared the most were to happen, it doesn't have to be today, maybe tomorrow, what would you feel and how would you respond? It's not about thinking. How, what would you think, right? Because that's what we do. When I knew that Harley was going to die, when I knew that my dad was going to die, I didn't need to think about what that meant. I needed to get in touch with how that would feel. Those are the things that kind of knock us down and keep us down. We can think our way out of anything. And I can tell you that the scariest things in my life before I had children and became a mother have happened to me. And I've grown from them. And it's, 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 it is as scary as it is at the time, <laughs> but after it's all over, it's not as scary as we often think it would be or will be. So there's four questions. We'll give you some time to get together and think about them and talk about them, and then we'll come back to a group, okay? <clears throat> Yeah, I 
I realize how much resignation I can't believe I actually did this. Something's going to be a lot of People say you shouldn't do anything until we do this. I think that's all right. So I was like, okay. It's all just to turn over here. Not knowing what the heck I was doing. And I can't um, assume so much how easy is that. A couple of days ago. Yes. Yes. We, we did it. We stayed with church. We never officially joined. We're not, again, I didn't know what tremendous joiners, but like we, we really, we really enjoyed it. It's the best fit for us. I'm like, see, I am strange people coming and I know. I know you So this, none of this was planned. But the question I have Yeah, the questions are all ready. You don't know what it is. So here is the chapter of the book 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 of the Totally different one. It's already the death. So all of this law, I think, has job changes. Although it's a calamity, it's so much better. So, um, and oh, I'm trying to figure out how to do it. It's just very, very important. Um, but I also work with a young man. So, it's not very much better. So, it's really straight. Oh, right now I just have a I was 
I've been a fan of all of these things. I don't know if I ever But now it's like everyone's comfortable now because I got a new life. And I'm back in the city. Harder. And all the stations. I just imagine it. You know, I'm in the
you are in your conversations if you want to wrap up in a minute or two we'll come back to our larger group I wonder final judgment Will anyone say they didn't they didn't worry enough about X? They didn't fear Y. Well, yeah, there's that's a big So that question goes I guess all this stuff. But it was fun. But it was fun. But it was fun. That's right. That's right. So I said, no. Because there's going to be issues. Why not? Oh, okay. It's a good cartoon in that. For a country western of the town. For today is called For a New, a New Beginning by John O'Donohue. In out of the way places of the heart where your thoughts never think to wander, this beginning has, be, has been quietly forming, waiting until you are ready to emerge. For a long time it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the great promises that sameness whispered, heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, wondered would you always live like this. Then the delight when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. 
Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease and risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm, for your soul senses the world that awaits you. Go now in peace.